Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. BS stands for Building Science, of course. Tonight's topic is wingnut testing with Peter Yost and David Gauthier. Um, uh, my name is Mike Maines. I'm a residential designer in Maine. Uh, and tonight I am drinking a local beer, Rising Tide Zephyr. It's a really good India pale ale brewed in Portland. Um, how they recommend it. Um, at the BS and Beer Show, we encourage local groups. Uh, BS and Beer started as just a local building science discussion group. And um, thanks to COVID, we switched to the Zoom platform and here we are, but we still encourage local groups. There's a dozen or so across the country and possibly one starting in Australia. Um, if you want any tips, uh, we will have some, have some notes up on the BS and Beer website soon uh, for how to start your own or feel free to just reach out to us reach out to us with any questions. Um, email sign up uh, to, 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 to get on our mailing list for this, uh, email sign up and a link to recorded shows are at the bsandbeershow.com. Um, you can also find them at Green Building Advisor. Um, and I would like to thank media partner, our media partners, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Brian. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brian Pontalillo from Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building. Um, I, I had a thought today because I always have, when, when I do my part of the introduction, I always have to go over the same details. So I thought my, I could nickname myself Boring Brian. Um, <laughs> but I just remembered, I was going to put that here where my name is, but I, I just remembered that, I just remembered. So next time, I'll be Boring Brian. Anyway, so the details for tonight's show, we're going to start off like we often do after we get through these introductions with a presentation from one of our panelists. Peter's gonna talk a little bit to get things kicked off about um, his wingnut testing process. Um, afterwards, we'll have a discussion amongst the, the panelists and hosts and, and then at some point we'll start to um, ask questions pulled from um, you who are, who are attending tonight's show. With that, I, I always forget who I go to next, but I think it might be Emily. <laughs> <laughs> might have been obvious tonight, right? Uh, hi guys, Emily. Uh, I'm an architect in Maine. Um, tonight I am having a Lone Pine made in Portland tessellation, double IPA, and I like to coordinate with my background. So <laughs> here we go. Um, I also want to bring up something special that we're going to try out as part of the BS and Beer Show. We're going to start a BS and Beer Show book club. So uh, for those of you out there who are readers and enjoy book clubs, um, who have listened to the podcast and got book recommendations, this quarter we are going to read The New Carbon Architecture by Bruce King. Um, for the next couple of months because, hey, we're all busy. We're going to read the new carbon architecture and then we're going to have Bruce on to talk about it uh, at the end of the quarter. So we'll put more up on the BS and Beer Show about the book club, what we're reading, um, and try to keep the conversation up on Green Building Advisor so we can kind of all talk about it as we're going through. Um, I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our guests. So tonight we have Peter Yost. Peter brings more than 30 years of experience in building, researching, teaching, writing, consulting on high performance buildings and their programs. His expertise ranges from everything from construction waste management, advanced framing, energy efficiency, indoor air quality, moisture management, building durability. Um, you can check him out on the Unbuild It podcast with Steve and Jake recently. So make sure you guys tune in for that. And he has a really awesome hat. So uh, he's been wearing that tonight for wingnut testing. Yeah. I kind of envious of the hat. <laughs> we also have Dave. Dave is currently the architectural product manager for Atlas Molded Products. Prior to his position, he spent years in the SIPs industry, as well as general contracting and timber framing. He was first and foremost a certifiable wingnut, always believing in trust but verify philosophy when it comes to products and processes. As far as quirky hobbies, make sure you pop over to the bsandbeershow.com and watch the video on social distancing in the third dimension that he just put up. Always look on the bright side. And actually, I might just throw the link in the chat box for you guys. It's, uh, it is a good watch. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to kick it back to Rob to give us a toast and kick us off for the evening. Hey, everybody. Um, Rob Watzek, I'm also with Fine Home Building and uh, 
sort of with Green Building Advisor. I help out there once in a while. Um, tonight, I'm drinking Imperial Sunshine, which is from Blue Point on Long Island. And uh, I got to take it easy on this one because it's 9.6%. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, here's to a good show. And uh, let's hear more about building science. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So, uh, yeah, um, we're going to turn it over to um, Peter to, to do our presentation on wing testing. I, I, th I, I think it's just Peter or Peter and Dave. Probably, um, yeah, we're both going to be thrown okay, in. Okay, okay, perfect. And I think uh, Rob or Brian will need to give them permission, which they did. Perfect. So, people seeing my screen? Yes, yep. it's not maximized yet. Just go ahead and hit full screen on your uh, yeah. PowerPoint there, and you'll be good. And I just did, and let's see. There we go. Well, howdy, everybody. And I guess I'm supposed to start with what I'm drinking. Um, I was pretty sure that this program started at 5, so that's when I started drinking. Um, <laughs> but unlike Rob, I'm going to tell you that um, I'm actually drinking uh, Heineken Zero. My wife and I started this uh, zero alcohol kick a little bit ago. And so cheers. I can just pound these down and it has absolutely no effect on anything except my bladder. <laughs> um, I also want you to know that I have peanuts. This is in honor of Dan Morrison, who was one of the founders of Green Building Advisor back in 2007. And Dan always taught me to keep a supply of peanuts to go with your beer. So uh, yeah, Dave and I are going to talk a bit about wing nut testing. You can tell by the first slide that there's a focus on um, uh, PSA tape testing, but we're going to branch out from there too. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, go ahead. Sorry, P Peter. Just um, you're on uh, you're on presenter view. You're not on the full screen view. Ah, uh, I thought I was. I mean, it's it's okay. I clicked, I clicked on. Um, my full screen. Yeah, just I think you want to do the, the, was the slideshow. Yeah, it's just we're, we're seeing. I your have next to move slide. that over, maybe. It, on, on the top left of your screen, do you see use slideshow? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Hold I, I on. Think, I, I'm not a PowerPoint expert. I'm just guessing, and it's it's really okay the way it is. It's just we can see your upcoming slides and whatnot. Oh, I don't want you to see my upcoming slides. There we go. <laughs> that's that's good. You got it now. So. Uh, yeah, wing nut testing facility. So uh, I'm going to introduce Dave in a second, but uh, I came home from work one day to my two young daughters. And, you know, we each share what we did during the day. And I said, yeah, well, you know, Dave, he's a friend of the family. And we started the wing nut testing facility. And my girls just sort of rolled their eyes. And they said, uh, yeah, I said, you know, we, we abbreviate it WTF. And so both girls like, oh, my God. And my wife just turned to them and says, let him go. He has no idea what WTF stands for besides wing nut test facility. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an appropriate title because it is sort of like, what the, uh, I'm not alone wing nut. Um, I've got good company. This is uh, Dave Gothier, my fellow wing nut. And can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. So in the left hand photo, you can see that this is one of the very first wing nut tests we did on, uh, PSA tapes, and we're using a tensiometer that Dave had in his business. I'll let Dave say a little bit about that in a second. But I just want to point out that this meeting here is a meeting of uh, a BS and beer group. It's called Sion, the Sustainable Energy Outreach Network, which has a builder's guild. And we were actually doing tape testing with the tensiometer at a builder guild meeting. And of course, we always have beer and food. And I just want to point out that this is our good friend, Jeff Gephardt, and he's given the evil eye to um, this fellow who just took the last beer. So nobody's really paying attention to Dave here. It's all about how many beers are left. And then on the right, this is Dave uh, as part of the wing nut testing uh, procedure that we're going to go into in a little bit more detail in just a bit. So with that, um, Dave, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in wing nut testing. Yeah, well, it's probably through my association with you more than anything else, Peter. But let me, let me start with... Um, I am enjoying my beer and tribute to my friend, newfound friends from Maine. I had to go with the Allagash White. 
uh, my my go-to domestic beer. So there you go. Nice. Cheers. Um, but Peter, you know, through Sion, Peter and I were um, looking at various things, and and in the the work that I was doing with the with sips, you know, I wanted a better way to to seal the sips joints and and that sort of thing. So, you know, I wanted to know the best tape to use and and how do we find that best tape. And Peter's going to go into this in more detail later, but you know, just looking at the ASTM tests don't tell you the whole story. So we wanted to do some some real life testing. And so Peter and I got together and started doing some real life testing on different substrates and different uh, uh, you know, conditions. And that's, it all went down from there. But looking at this picture here, I wanna point out that the first round of tape testing that we did was actually sticking tape to the top of my head. Um, and you can see the <laughs> results of that very, very quickly. <laughs> A little bit of a substrate problem there, buddy. Right. Delamination. <laughs> and you can see that, you know, uh, we're really concerned about my safety with the brain bucket. He didn't get a brain bucket. We have no eye protection. Uh, but this was our first public WTF testing because it was at the Nessie conference in 2015 as sort of an exhibit floor thing that we did. Um, and we're going to get into more details about, of course, the whys and the wherefores of... Um, so Dave, tell us a little bit about this slide. This yeah, is this is uh, Dave, the early years. Um, I, I started out my career as a forester, actually, and then found out that I could make more money working at McDonald's than I could as a forester. So I, I get into timber framing and found out I couldn't make a whole lot of money doing that either. But, um, but I really, really enjoyed timber framing. This is um, uh, me setting a, a rafter on, I guess it's a two-story colonial timber frame that I built. I was basically a one-man shop, just cutting and, and you know doing all the work myself. Uh, had some friends help on raising day, and this is me uh, lowering you know one of the last rafter sets into place. Uh, this is probably 30 years ago or so. Yeah, you look spry. You've got uh, your clearly you have uh, uh, steel-toed sneakers, and you have the appropriate safety headgear and oh yeah, you're roped all, in and everything. All tied in. I think you're you just know? doing great. Depending uh, on what part of me you're looking at, I'm either 18 feet or 24 feet off the ground there. <laughs> so how did this all get started? Well, um, when we developed all the drawings for Green Building Advisors, Steve Basic did over a thousand of them. Um, I was doing a presentation, a two-day presentation at the International Builders Show for their Advanced Green Building Building Science two-day thing. And so I'm showing all these details talking about, you know, what you should talk about when you talk about high performance energy efficiency, durability, but really important how you get continuous air control airs, water control airs, thermal, and then a vapor profile. And some guy stood up in the back about halfway through the first day and he said, hey, you know, you're talking a lot about these continuous uh, control airs. Um, they're all buried inside the, the wall or the roof assembly. How long does do all the sealants and tapes that you've got specced in your drawings, how long do those last? And you know, as he developed his question, I could feel my stomach dropping because the answer was, I have no freaking clue how long any of this stuff lasts. And it's all in the middle of the assemblies that we're claiming are, you know, 200 year assemblies. So I figured I better go out and find more about um, how tapes worked. And Dave, you had a particular interest in terms of sealing up panels, right? That's correct. Yeah, so, you know, again, the, working with SIPs, they, the Achilles heel of a SIP system is in the joints. So we'd, we'd always, you know, foam in the joints and try to get a good seal that way. But I'd like the belt and suspenders um, methodology, and so I wanted to have a tape on there as well as a backup. And, and Dave and I were on a, the Building Science Corporation Building America team together. We were both members of CEON. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of fell into cahoots over this whole thing. So we're talking about pressure sensitive adhesive tapes. It's the first wing nut testing we did, PSA. And so what are they? And I had to learn a lot, but you know, they have three major components, the backer, the adhesive, and the substrate. Um, and you, know, you can have a release paper. You can see this roll of uh, pressure sensitive adhesive tape in the front has a release paper. And I have that in quotation marks because of course not all tapes have them. The tape right behind it doesn't. And it turns out that this is really important because if you have a release paper, then the, the performance qualities of the backer change because that, you know, if you build the wrong backer 
and it's not a bond break to the adhesive, then when you make a roll of tape, you're done. You can't unroll it. So this whole issue of release papers and how it frees up the properties of the backers are something else that can be important with uh, pressure sensitive adhesive tapes. And then, you know, so after that debacle at the International Builders Show Today training, I started to do research on, you know, well, how do we figure out how these tapes work? And this is just a partial list of all the different types of ASTM tests that you can do for pressure sensitive adhesive tapes. And, you know, I don't, I didn't coin this phrase. I'm pretty sure it was John Straw who said, oh, ASTM does not stand for the American Society for Testing Materials. It stands for another stupid test method. Um, and, you know, how do you know which of these tests to use? The manufacturers get to sort of cherry pick. They can pick the ones that work the best with their tape. Um, and so a lot of us as builders and architects, we don't know which tests we should be invoking or looking for when we look on the label for which tests comply. And then, you know, here's the real kicker for the evolution of the wing nut test facility, which is what are the laboratory conditions that all ASTM tests require for anything sticky? Um, well, the substrate has to be stainless steel. And of course, all of us use our tapes on stainless steel substrates. That's all we use, right? We don't use anything else that we adhere the tape to. Um, the substrate has to be perfectly clean. In fact, they acetone watch, wash all the surfaces. Of course, with, that's what we do on job sites. We carry around gallons of acetone to clean our substrates. They test at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then they test at 50% standard relative humidity. And come on, look at this guy. He's got clean trimmed fingernails. He's using these silly little scissors instead of a utility knife. What the hell? And he's got bare soft hands. I mean, that, come on, that's not how we work with construction materials. So what happens on the job site? It's cold quite often. I know some, not everybody is from New England, but um, we get cold, we get really hot. Uh, the job sites are dirty and they're wet. So I love this. You know, Dave and I always call each other before we're gonna show up on the job site to discuss what type of uh, large plastic bag we're gonna wear as our rainwear that day. Um, and, and the other thing is, th this is just scary, right? I mean, this guy's looking at him thinking, do you really think you should just drop that circuit or saw down to cut this uh, floor joist off? But in any event, um, this is what we're faced up with. And that's why we thought that we needed to do wing nut testing, which is, has very little to do with ASTM testing, but it could be just as relevant or helpful. So at the very beginning, Dave and I, uh, you, could, you, you can see that this says round two, right? So round one was back with that tensiometer that Dave had in his lab at the SIP plant. And that proved to be pretty useful, but we thought, hey, man, I don't know if that's really the, the type of stress that we should be evaluating. So Dave and I saw this one, it's like, oh, cool, look, you know, you, you do an inline pull with the tape. The, uh, when, when the tape releases, the metal weight falls into a container and it clicks the, uh, kicks off the clock. So you don't even have to be around. You can just let this thing go and it'll record for you when the tape fails, right? So that's what Dave and I did. Dave, do you want to introduce our ASTM WTF testing here? Yeah, I mean, we had to come up with weights, and the only thing we had was uh, the bottles in our recycle bin, recycle bin at the uh, at the plant. So we um, did the best we could. We filled some bottles with sand, and we weighed them so they're all the same. Um, some spare uh, paper clips from the supply closet uh, helped us out with the connection, and then we had a number of different substrates on there, and I don't think they're all shown, but we had. OSB smooth side, OSB rough side, plywood, um, film laminated, um, EPS, uh, polyiso, foil face polyiso, um, straight XPS. So we had a number of different substrates and what is that, five or, or so different types of tape on each one. And yeah, we, Dave, I just figured out that this little shed roof above here. Yeah. We put that up because there's a second row above we had, this. We had we round three up above it. That's right. We didn't yeah. want dropping uh, soda bottles to hit the lower ones. So 
because Dave and I were trying to figure out, well, that's not all the testing we did. So you can see we're trying to pick a bunch of different substrates. And, and you know, Dave, the, the way that we chose the substrates and the tapes was largely from Sion members who that's said, right. hey, I'd like you to try this tape um, on this substrate. Um, and you'll notice that it's outdoors. Um, it's in a protected area, so it's not seeing ultraviolet light. It's not seeing wind, but it is seeing uh, changes in temperature and moisture content. And that's why we had a hobo out there to document those conditions that were varying widely, which is how much moisture, how much moisture in the air are all these uh, materials seeing, and then what was the temperature. So it's kind of like what they would see if they were protected from ultraviolet light and direct water um, as part of a wall assembly. Um, but they would see plenty of changes in the moisture content of the air and, and the temperature. Um, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later. So, you know, then I said to Dave, I said, no, no, we don't get these steady pulls, right? What the, the tapes, particularly like around windows or, or just any part of an out, outside a exterior wall or roof assembly, they're getting bellowed. They're getting pushed back and forth. So I talked Dave into building a pressure pig. Dave, what is a pressure pig? Well, the pressure pig, pig stands for a pressure indicating gizmo. Um, oh, shit. That's I didn't basically, know that. we <laughs> wanted, um, Peter was really hung up on this bellowing action of the tape and how it's critical to the, the tape uh, staying adhered to the substrate. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of billowing that goes on in that, uh, you know, potentially going on in the assembly. So we want to make sure, we, you know, we test for that phenomenon going on. So I actually, you know, had one of the guys in our, in our shop who's, you know, one of these good old boys from New Hampshire that I don't think he made it past the eighth grade, but by Jesus, he could build anything he, he wanted to build. build. Anything. And so he, um, he, he got this built and we would clamp down a substrate on, over that hole that you see we would apply pressure to it and uh, there would be a slot in that substrate and that would that would uh, force the pressure onto the tape and the tape would billow out. Uh, so we're going to so, show how it mounts on here. But, you know, Dave and I thought, oh, okay, let's just hook up a, you know, a job site compressor to it. And you can see written right on the front here is 150 PSI. Well, the tape blew off the first pressure pig at about two PSI. And so Dave and I looked at each other like, huh, that doesn't seem like very much pressure. Uh, wait a minute. And then Dave said, Isn't, aren't there an awful lot of Pascals in one PSI? Yeah. Yeah, so Dave, we finally, I remember you holding up your phone and looking on the internet and us going, oh my gosh, how many PSI are there in a, uh, or how many Pascals are there in a PSI? Yeah, there, there's like uh, 6,875 or something like that, 95. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so what do we learn? You know, Peter was pretty hung up on this whole bellowing action, and I pointed out to him that in an, in an F5 tornado or a Category 5 hurricane, the pressure differential between the, the center of those cyclones and, and the outside is about 100 millibar. And so you do the math on that, that's about 10,000 pascals. Um, and you convert that, and it's about 1.45 PSI. So going up to 2 PSI and the tape fails, I'd say you can rest assured that when your house gets hit by an F5 tornado, <laughs> you don't have to worry about the tape failing. The <laughs> tape will hold. To completely, completely useful information. But that's when we learned more about pressure. And you can see Dave has replaced the, the huge job set compressor with a, an air mattress pump. And then he set it up really cool where if you let the air flow past at a right angle, you get a negative pressure. You can see here that the valve's wide open. And so as the air streams across here, it creates a negative 74 Pascals. And all Dave had to do was throw this handle back and forth and we could bellow it from minus 75 to plus 75. And then we just had to get somebody to stand there and do that for, hell, we didn't know how long, how many cycles. So it turns out this was a great idea, we thought, but it was, wasn't very practical in terms of how we were gonna get actual testing of tapes done. So we're constantly going through these iterations, trying to make more sense out of those ASTM standards. So we, we, the, the next round of testing, this is what I am really proud of. Um, we decided to cut a groove in a piece of OSB 
like what would happen at a rough opening at a window. And so the tape here was half adhered to the rough side of OSB, which would have it be attached to the wall. And the other half of the tape, we adhered to either a aluminum flange for a window or a PVC flange for a window. And then we put a metal bar that was stiff enough that as we suspended this weight, that it would pull evenly across the tape. And we reduce, and so, you know, now we got to do math, right? So we're just going to go through this really quickly because we don't have much time. But um, we did the math to show that we were using pressure on this tape that was more reasonable than the center of an F5 tornado. And we took the protocol that we wrote up for this and we sent it to several tape manufacturers or industrial chemical companies and got their technical staff. We thought we would get it back and they would say, you guys are nuts. You just should just you know, stop this before you get arrested. Um, but to Dave and my surprise, they came back and said, hey, that's a pretty cool test. Uh, we're kind of curious to see how it's gonna work. Um, so here you can see we've set up a whole bunch of tapes on exactly the way I just described. And we put them in our buddy Tom McLaughlin's shop, which um, turns out uh, was very poorly heated. So we could count on it moving up and down in temperature and moisture. But Dave did, uh, Tom did a little bit too good of a job heating the shop in the winter. So we actually moved this assembly to a different location. So it would go down so it would see temperatures during the winter that were more realistic, down to zero degrees. Um, but what we also did was, you know, this is the top side or, the, or sort of the back side. We wet the OSB from both the inside and the outside on this side to simulate condensation on the um, assembly and then wetting it down from the outside for water that got past the uh, cladding and was actually hitting um, the wall. So we're stress testing it with moisture in the air. We're stress testing it with actually condensed water or rainwater that gets passed. And you can see that this is a very early uh, uh, part of the testing. Note that you have the tape half adhered on the OSB, half adhered on a, a, a window flange. And then you can see that this tape has already started to pull. Um, and then what we also did is we would take the weights off and put the weights on. So that's how we simulated bellowing. Now we didn't get negative pressure, we just got positive pressure and zero pressure, but we were trying to, to simulate as best we could. Um, so here I am after we've moved the whole assembly and what we did is we, we didn't move all of them out because a whole bunch have already dropped. Um, so we only moved the very highest performance acrylic adhesive PSA out here. And uh, in this outdoor shed, the temperature ended up going up to 90 or more in the summer and going down to zero in the winter. And then periodically I would go out and um, spritz with exact count. Um, you can see this as an ASTM spritz dispenser um, to simulate uh, bulk water getting passed on the outside and then condensation happening on the inside. And here you can see I've taken the weights off to do the wetting. And um, what I wanna show you on this slide or maybe Dave, you could jump in. So remember, we're always recording the temperature and relative humidity with that Hobo data logger. And Dave, what did we learn when we lined up when the tapes failed with the temperature and relative humidity? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, basically, you know, in, in the extremes is when the tape failed. It's it's kind of kind of intuitive. But when you start seeing the extremes in temperature and the extremes in humidity, the, the tapes let go. And, and the key is they changed with great, they, they dropped when things changed a lot. So think about it. If you're a PVC or an aluminum flange and the temperature's varying, you're gonna react to that quite a bit. You're probably not gonna react to the water, but the OSB is doing its own thing. And then the tape is doing a third different thing. So it's not a big surprise that in all the testing Dave and I did, when we got tapes failing, it was when they were being stressed. And when they were being stressed, it was because of changes, material property changes. So that was kind of the big aha moment for us. Um, and you can see here that, you know, the tape has started to pull away. Uh, you, you can see this edge is just coming free. 
as much as tapes don't like rough OSB, they like totally uh, mono surfaces like PVC and aluminum even less. Um, you can see here the tape has failed. This is a high performance tape, um, but it just did not like what was happening with the, PV, with the PVC. Um, the other thing, I actually have to go back. The other thing you might notice is that right here along my cursor, Dave and I had the, I guess the smarts to mark with a magic marker where the tape was when we started the test. And what you can see is that with the loading and offloading over time, the tape starts to creep, right? And you can see here that on this particular situation, the adhesive is actually being pulled away from the backer. It's holding, but it's being pulled away. Um, so we, with the bellowing, we, I still think that's in a really important action, but what we're driving for is how do we do testing in the real world that may not be totally real world, but is magnitudes better than what happens with the ASTM testing. Um, so we're wrapping up here in terms of time, but I just wanna say that um, I wrote about 15 blogs, uh, mostly when I was at Building Green before going with my own company, Building Right. But um, the whole Sticky Business series of blogs that it's about um, pressure sensitive adhesive tapes and sealants, because they're kind of their own problem, um, there's, a, there's a whole blog series on my website that you can go and if you're interested in more wingnut stuff or more stuff about sticky business with sealants and tapes, you should take a gander at that. And then um, I just wanna say that um, I've done a lot of testing on other things that come up. Like whenever I do a building science training on retrofit, I'm, I can count on getting the question, hey, you know, if I have a basement that doesn't have anything on the outside because it's old, um, can I, how, how about all those materials that you can put on the interior of the foundation wall, whether that be concrete or brick or uh, rubble or uh, CMU, are there any that work on what we call the negative side? So I did a whole bunch of testing on that. You can see that's here. You can, all, all these are blogs on Green Building Advisor. Um, this is my work another day, time with Dave. Um, Dave's helped out a ton with the Soffit the Ridge Cathedral Roof Venting. It turns out that the, the science behind the net free area and the ventilation stuff is just totally just made up. It's based on very limited research. Um, and the way, that, the way that ventilation air moves through a three-dimensional volume in an attic is completely different than the way that uh, ventilation air moves through a chute like in cathedral roof venting. Um, so there's, we've done, I've done a lot of root, uh, WTF testing on that. I've done a little bit on kitchen exhaust as part of a, a green building advisor Q&A. And then I wanted to let you know that um, I just completed um, above grade masonry paint and stain testing. Um, and I did that because I used one material on my own home to try to waterproof or make more resistant the CMU blocks that are above grade, right? Because we, whatever we're using below grade, we stop at grade and magically the water's not supposed to get into the stuff that's above grade. But in any event, there's a whole bunch of different materials that you can use for above grade masonry water protection. And I just got done a round of testing on three different types of that, which I'll be posting on Green Building Advisor soon. And then, um, you know, we have these single or two piece sill pan flashings that um, make the three-dimensional turn at the corners in the sills. And when you stretch those, and I'm thinking mainly of stretch tape for the Huber system, the zip wall system, I'm thinking DuPont's flex wrap, um, uh, Ecto Seal is the system, high performance acrylic from 475 and Proclima. But when you take and turn that corner in three different directions and stretch that tape, you're introducing a lot of stress to the material. So I, I, wanna, I wanna test and see what the outcome is of that extra stress when we get the superior water resistance of no crazy corner origami um, in those corners to meet all three planes 
at the corners of a sill. Um, but but what's, the, what's the impact of the stress that we introduce with that uh, uh, three plane accommodation? Um, so here you can see I'm doing some ASTM testing of the waterproofing on a block. This is a turkey baster um, that I'm dribbling the water down. And um, my neighbor on the other side was looking at me and his response to what I was doing was, that is the ugliest looking turkey I've ever seen. He clearly doesn't understand wing nut waterproof <laughs> testing. So that's it. That's what it means to be a wing nut and test a whole bunch of different tapes. And uh, Dave, do you have any closing thoughts? No, it's just important to, to point out, a lot of people ask us after seeing this kind of thing, okay, what tape do you like? What tape is best? And that's not really, although we had you know, some of that as, as one of our goals, but what we're trying to point out more than anything else is it's not the tape, it's the testing. Um, you know, ASTM tests are absolutely critical and important. Um, there's a reason they exist. You need to have, you know, tests that are, you know, you can replicate um, and, and are standardized across the industry. But at the same point, you need to test real life situations. And that's what Peter and I are trying to do is, is bring the, the standardized testing into real life and just throwing stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Oh, I love it. Throw it against the wall. See what's oh, man. How long did you work on that? But yeah, I do want to say, Dave, um, yeah, uh, we need both. We need the ASTM tests because those results are important, but they're, they're necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and the reason we, Dave and I were real excited about doing this on the BS and Beer show is this is the community that should be drinking beer and doing wing nut testing, right? Because if just Dave and I are testing tapes, we can't live long enough to, to get enough results. All of our results were anecdotal. But if a whole bunch of us start to do these tests, we're going to learn way more than if it's just a couple people testing. So not only should we be building a community of people studying building science and drinking beer, we should be uh, expanding the wing nut uh, test community as well. My dad is a Luther minister. I'm a bit of a wing nut evangelist. <laughs> Um, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. That that was great. Um, you guys got, guys have really put in a lot of effort to um, in, into testing in ways that will actually help us. Um, our, our first uh, chat box question was from Graydon Tripp, uh, who uh, specifically for Peter, he wanted to know uh, how, how you put up with Jake and Steve on the Unbuild It podcast. <laughs> uh, um, I'll, I'll let you answer, answer that, that one <laughs> later. Um, my, my sort of te te technical question uh, on the tape test, test, I know a lot, of, um, a lot of or most acrylic tapes are time sensitive, they're, they're pressure and time sensitive. And like mm. I use you know, 3M8067, Sega Wee Glove, uh, Proclima Tescon Vanna, those, th those are my go-to tapes and they all have different qualities, different times. Did you guys, guys do the, 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 the rolling and the squeegeeing and the weighting and all that stuff um, before, be, be, before you st started adding the weights? That's a great question. And we did make sure that we followed each manufacturer's installation instructions um, mm -hmm. because they're not, always exactly the same. Um, and we did not load the tapes up for 24 hours. Now that's, you know, that, that is one of the recommendations that the full adhesive wetting process, you know, takes 24 hours. You know, you don't always get that on a job site, but if you sure. can, it's important not to load up the tape. And, and we also observe that. We didn't load any tape up until after 24 hours. Yeah, I believe uh, Zip, Zip, I think, Huber, Huber wants 72 hours before it's, it's expected to resist water, which can be hard to find th three, three days without rain in, in s s some places. Um, or, or no, and I liked, I liked y y your pig, 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 pig test, and it, it's, it's the reason uh, when we do blower door testing, that's why you're supposed to do both positive and negative. A lot of people just yeah. do one or the other, but you're really supposed to do both because things may seal well in one direction, but may be tend to, to pull off in the other direction. Um, yeah, and I did want to say that um, you mentioned 3M8067. 
and the Sega and the Proclima or, or, or the Zip, what, what Dave and I found is sort of almost across the board, it was the acrylic PSA tapes that, that performed most consistently and, and at the upper, not, not uniformly, but, um, <laughs> and the other thing was that the, the reason Zip was so popular with the Sion group is uh, one of their complaints of both Proclaim and Sega was they got too many tapes. Like, how am I supposed to keep all these different tapes in my truck? Like, give me one tape. I want to use it to, you know, put my fender back together on my truck. I want to, you know, pass OSHA with my ladder with that tape. And then, by the way, I wanted to work on buildings too. Um, and so, you know, we did have all three of the major acrylic tapes um, perform well, but uh, Zip, Zip was a bit of a standout. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Peter, so, so I'm sorry, Mike. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I jump in. So one of the things that, one of the questions I, I like to ask um, builders, especially, you know, more progressive builders or, you know, um, sort of builders are on the cutting edge of, of technology and new materials and new assemblies is sort of what they, you know, what they think, um, you know, we've seen a lot of failures over the years, like things that we use, you know, products, materials we use, process that we use that we thought were great. And then like, you know, half a century later, we find out, well, that didn't work out so well. Um, and so one of the things I always ask, what do you think we're doing today that might not work out so well? And the, the big concern that everyone seems to have is the reliance on tapes. And yeah. so I'm just sort of curious in, in general, like with all that, all the, you know, this wing net testing and the research that you guys have put into tapes, how do you, where do you come down on that right yeah. now in terms of, because of this great reliance on tapes in our buildings, do you feel good about it, or do you you have the same sort of apprehension towards it? Dave, I'll go first, and maybe you can jump in too, because I know yeah, Dave's ahead. done a lot of work on 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 tapes uh, after he left the SIP manufacturer. But I would say this: um, the 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 only way you can get a consistent water control layer, and a particularly a consistent air control layer, is with something sticky. Um, and sticky means big, complicated polymers. And um, that, that makes me nervous. However, um, the least nervous I am is about tapes. Um, I'm most nervous about mastics and um, particularly sealants. Um, Sealants often get used in ways that are totally inappropriate to what they're designed for. Like, why do we put sealant behind the flanges of windows? That's an adhesive function, not, not a liquid sealant. Liquid sealants are designed to be beaded. So it's like, why, why in the world would we slap sealant behind the flanges and then squish it like it's supposed to be an adhesive? It's, it's totally, it doesn't make any sense. And um, I think that in the long term, the tapes are going to prove to be a lot more reliable than particularly the other options we have, which are mastics or sealants. Um, now, we have a whole new category with uh, fluid applied materials, mm. right? And so uh, and I'm not quite sure where they land in terms of, well, they're not really a sealant, but they certainly aren't a tape. Um, and um, there's a there's a leading natural uh, builder here in uh, Brattleboro who has figured out how to do largely non-complicated polymer uh, air and water control air systems, but it all comes back to he's, he's dependent on tapes, right? Um, and um, so the most important thing you can do is pick a really good tape. Uh, the other thing is that this, you know, we have accelerated testing, um, but I built uh, the outside of our first floor uh, with clabbers that are on stainless steel uh, trim screws so I can take the assembly apart and inspect the adhesion of my closed cell foam to different substrates in the wall because I want to know how that's doing over time. So I think that um, we need to also do wing nut testing where we can do accelerated testing with advancing the stresses but we ought to do like what Steve Basic did, take a piece of uh, zip wall, uh, tape it together and throw it on a wood pile and go check it at the end of every year. Um, we need to do that type of testing because um, that's the real world. And interestingly with the, 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 Steve's actually done this, it's been out there for like 
13 or 14 years, um, the OSB, of course, is shot, right? He's just thrown on his woodpile. But the tape is still adhered to the OSB. And a lot of that has to do with Huber putting in a lot of time and money to matching the substrate properties, the green polymeric uh, coating, to that tape. Um, and now it's your turn, Dave. Sorry. No, you said a great, Peter. You know, the other, a couple of the things I want to add is, you know, when a lot of people grab a roll of tape, they think the tape is going to be, you know, solve all their problems no matter how they use it. And a lot of tapes are designed to be used in certain ways. Um, some is designed to be used in shear. Some is more tensile strength. Um, you know, some is designed to use as a gasket. So there's, there's all different ways to use tape. And so you've got to be, be careful and make sure you're using the tape appropriately. It, it is an ideal to have, as somebody said, one tape to rule them all. Um, but I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if that is the right solution because there's so many different variables in a building assembly that you, you need to make sure you're using the tape correctly. And, and as you know, the, the two of us found out, you know, the, the acrylics, and I'm not pegging one tape over another, but the acrylics do seem to perform um, the best and seem to have the best longevity. Um, when I look at, you know, some of the butyls or the rubber-based or asphaltic tapes, um, you know, you get ac uh, oxidation taking place. Uh, some of that uh, adhesion is, is just going to, you know, lose its legs, so to speak. Um, you had a picture up there of when the, the tape is peeling apart and the, the, the adhesive was actually stretching out. That has legs. That's going to that's gonna stay bonded when it comes back together. Um, and, and, and even creep. Creep is not necessarily a bad thing in tape. Um, huh. You'd rather have it move a little bit and creep a little bit, oh, stress relief, creepy, than absolutely fail. So there's, you know, there's, there's different aspects to tape, and using the right tape in the right situation is is important. And the only way you're going to know that is do some wing nut testing. And I just yeah. saw Doug Horgan pop up and say, "Hey, did you test 3M8067?" Doug, the day that we were setting up the tapes, I went looking for 3M8067 and went to four different local. Uh, building supply could not find any 3m8067 this guy said hey this other tape it says high performance acrylic right on it and D dave that was that red cellophane tape i forget yeah. what the name was it failed miserably yeah. but we really wanted to test their 3m8067 because there are so many builders that you use it um you know one of the things too that dave and i learned is the more expensive acrylic tapes that have a much deeper bed right, more adhesive to liquefy or to wet, that makes a difference. So it makes, makes the tape difference. more expensive, but it, it definitely was a was a, a, a factor. Yeah, and then, and then you get, I mean, there, there are some manufacturers coming out now where just the adhesive layer itself is nail sealing. Um, you know, most tapes are relying on their, their backing, the, the substrate to, to be the, the nail sealer, the polyolefin backing or what have you. But their, their acrylics are getting to the advanced point now where just the acrylic itself can be a nail sealing uh, layer. So, you know, a lot of advances are taking place in tapes. Um, we're not done on the, on the whole evolutionary thing. So, you know, just be aware of what's out there and, and test it. Yeah. And, you know, well, sorry, I was just going to say, Dave, Dave and I tried really hard to take the wing nut testing and work with universities like UMass Amherst. Dave's a graduate from there. I, I was an adjunct faculty there. And um, it just, we, we've been doing this now for four or five years, trying to move wing nut testing to grow up to be something more statistically significant, better organized. And, you know, we're, we neither of us is getting paid to do this, and it's just never taken hold. I am making some inroads at Keene State College to maybe get some uh, wing nut type testing uh, there, but uh, not yet. So Peter, that, that was something I actually was going to ask you a question about is like, obviously, uh, you guys are kind of taking it upon yourself to do this testing and like, who does or who should be paying for this taste testing? Or do you think it's just up to every all the builders out there in the different parts of the, the world that uh, are using these materials to test it on their own? I think both. I think we need the collective experience, right? You know, no one can test tapes enough. And you know, stuff comes up like, hey, we didn't think about this particular stress that we could maybe assess. So I, I, think, I think we still need, you know, BS and beer and WTF testing where people share the results. Um, but um, 
I'm, I'm also working on a Building America team where there is a small chance that we might get some backing to actually do more substantial wing nut type testing. Um, so I think we need a, a bit of both. I, I, I'm pretty fond of using products from manufacturers who send me free tapes to test that give me access to their technical people um, and sort of aren't afraid to have their, tups, their, test, uh, the, their tapes tested. Um, and you know, um, we all know that most manufacturers do non-ASTM tests. They simply don't report them. Um, yeah, that, that was a point I was just going to make, Peter, that there's a lot of smart people that work at these the tape manufacturing uh, facilities, and they are doing their own semi wing nut testing, but you're not going to hear the bad stuff from them. They're not, yeah. You're not going to hear about the failures. Um, they're just going to, you know, crow about the, the good stuff that they have. So having, you know, independent people out there, the wing nuts, the BS and beer people, Sion people out there doing their own tests, and then somehow getting a collective knowledge, a hive mind, if you will, then um, you know that's that's where the the, the good stuff is going to be disseminated from. So, so one thing, guys, about uh, all these different tests that you guys are testing, uh, tapes that you're testing, is uh, some Russell Chapman in the chat box asked, uh, "What about I, what I can buy at the local store?" I mean, you figure ninety nine percent of the builders out there aren't going to be going to 475 and ordering some fancy European tape. So do you see the better tapes being available at the, at the built, local building supplies in the future if more people get in, in, interested in this stuff? Well, you know, Martin did some testing. 3M 8067 did well with his testing, which was quite different from what we did. Um, we didn't actually test 3M 8067, but you know, what I hear from builders is that that's a really good go-to tape. It's pretty widely available. Um, it's recommended so, all the time on GBA, Peter. When tape yeah. questions come up, it, that tape gets recommended a lot. Yeah, I, I, I really wish we had been able to test it because it yeah. was definitely one that, you know, it's an acrylic and it comes from, uh, you know, the same company that makes tapes for other high performance systems. Um, so to answer your question, Rob, um, the, the only way we can know which over the counter stuff works is for a bunch of us to try that, try those tapes because some, sometimes they're regional, you know, there, there are national tape manufacturers or national chem chemical companies. There are a lot of mom and pop uh, PSA tape manufacturers as well. Um, so it, I was, uh, when I was working on testing liquid sealants, I was at a building science corporation summer camp event and one of the guys from uh, Walsh construction out on the West coast walked up to me and he said, and he showed me a picture on his phone. They had a whole garage full of like a thousand uh, liquid sealant tests on different substrates that, that, that they've been doing for years, their own testing of the materials. Um, so if we could gather that information, right. So that we're not all just, constantly reinventing, then we become part of the, the power, right? I mean, um, if, if, if a whole bunch of people that work in the field test the tape and it comes out great um, or not, you know, can we use that to leverage with the manufacturing community? And I think the answer is yes. I just want to say, I started working at the NHB Research Center in 1993. Um, and that was just when most building product manufacturers we're scaling down field techs. And here we are introducing more products at a faster pace with more uh, permutations of how they could be used. And we're taking field techs out of the picture. So, you know, it's expensive to have a lot of field people that are uh, truth testing how do the products work in the field. But when manufacturers are forced to cut back on those field people, uh, you know who pays the price for that? Practitioners, architects and builders, because now we're the guinea pigs rather than having them be part of this sort of discovery process of how these things actually do work in the field. Well, and what you said earlier about how uh, some manufacturers are willing to give up their materials 
for you to do testing. I know that some of the more reputable manufacturers do that sort of field testing by finding some, uh, you know, com contractors that they know to give their er the products to the in the early stages of development. So hopefully, uh, hopefully enough of them are doing that as well. But uh, we had one question from Ryan in the audience. He said, uh, "Do you look at any at red list chemicals when you're considering uh, tapes?" Great question. No, no, we did not look. Uh, my understanding of acrylics is that they are among the more benign, but I have no idea whether they're on the red list or not. I'm pretty sure acrylics are not. Um, and, uh, you know, the other interesting thing is that, um, aero barrier, you know, the, the, uh, process where they atomize a sealant colloidally suspended, and then it doesn't cling to things until it's moving past, um, that's an acrylic sealant. Um, and that's one that's airborne inside the building. So, um, that's a great question though. It'd be nice to learn more about red list components of any types of sealants or tapes. Uh, on that note though, Peter, on, um, and this is a little bit off topic, but uh, do you know of any resources that where people can, can easily kind of look that sort of stuff up? I know Building Green had for years been working with, uh, is it Green Spec or what is it, the, uh, the guide that they have? Yeah, well, green specs long gone, but yeah. there are environmental product declarations (EPDs), and you know there was uh, there were a number of people building green that thought, well, rather than red list, why can't we get a like a green list, right? Not not the not the ones that don't work or that we can't use, but what are the ones that we can? Sort of the flip side of that, um, and and that was the whole theory behind environmental product declarations was that um, most manufacturers do not want to reveal what their, you know, and their, the material safety data sheet doesn't require you to always reveal proprietary uh, elements of your system, particularly if they're in small enough quantities. Um, and so the environmental product declaration was saying, okay, the MSDS is not going to work. Let's develop a new system. Um, and that is the system where the product is labeled just like a box of cereal with exactly what's in it. Um, and you don't, because, you know, I was working with, uh, Dave, Tom McLaughlin was, uh, is a, well, he, he rebuilds and restores windows and he was working at a college that had a, uh, a living building challenge. And, you know, it took them months to get all the sealants and putties that he used as part of his process to get approved. He goes, you know, I'm just a guy restoring windows. I don't have the resources and it was slowing down the job. And so um, had he had environmental product declarations where he could go not through sort of a poker game process with a manufacturer about what is actually in your uh, product, but like this one is approved. It, it is an EPD, has an environmental product declaration that we can use because it's transparent about what chemicals are in the materials. There, it seems like there are more and more um, databases being built for that stuff. And I, I'm encouraged that we'll, we'll see more and more, um, we'll have more and more accessible information in the future. Just like, um, I think the Living Building Challenge has a list, is building a list of, of products. The Parsons Healthy Materials Lab is building a list of products. So there's, there's more and more places to go to, to, to look for that stuff, I'm finding. Um, over time, which is good, but you're right, Peter. And, and I've, I've, you know, I've spoken with lots of manufacturers doing research on products where they just simply put up a roadblock. Like, no, we, we won't, we won't tell you what it is. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and I try to explain to them, like, you know, our readers will be more likely to use your product if they have, feel like they have solid information about it. And let's just simply say no. Right. You know? It's proprietary. Yeah. It was funny when I was working at Building Science Corporation, I remember Joe saying, I said, you know, Joe, what's the permeability of this paint? And he said, uh, I don't know, but um, you know, we go up to a manufacturer and we ask them what it is. And, and if they don't know what vapor permeability is, don't use that product mm. because they don't even know what vapor permeability is. And he said, but if they can't provide the number, just say, well, until you can provide me the vapor permeability, we're going to go looking for 
a product manufacturer of paint that does know or is willing to sell or it's on their and that puts a lot of pressure on manufacturers because you know if if the leading practitioners in our field for building science architecture engineering and building um are working to identify you know the the ones that work um that's that could go a long way and uh believe me a lot of building product manufacturers pay pretty close attention to what's going on on fine home building green building advisor um you know a lot of the the leading high performance source of information they're they're very aware of how their products are are discussed on those forums yeah a couple of people in the comments have uh sent links to the livingfuture.org declare page which talks about uh, the different properties of different materials and how healthy they are. Declare program. Yeah, and the guy <clears throat> who's been hired relatively recently by uh, uh, the ILFI is uh, Greg Norris, who's a life cycle analysis guy that I went to graduate school at UNH. And, um, you know, he's a big part of uh, uh, this whole full disclosure for life cycle assessment of buildings and materials. So we have so, a, we have a few questions lingering that I'd like to that I'd like to get to um, while we still have some time left. From and these are audience questions. One of the one of them was, uh, "What's the future of tape? Do you guys have any any thoughts on that?" Um. Huh. <laughs> well, uh, I do know that many manufacturers are working on tapes that do better at even lower and higher temperatures. Right. Um, uh, I know that there's increasing interest in the property of backer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a bit conflicted because if you change the ass, if you change a lot of the properties of the backer, it means you're going to have to go to a release paper and release papers are just, they're a pain in the ass to deal with on a job site and they create a lot of waste but it does allow you to completely change the backer. And, um, you know, I don't really know how important the vapor permeability is of these little strips that we put around rough openings, but I can imagine that there's some probability or chance that it would be better for them to be vapor permeable than not. And a lot of the tapes that um, don't have release paper are based on materials that to get the bond break means that they're vapor impermeable or very low permeability. So I think, I think we're going to see these tapes um, uh, change over time. And um, I think that we're going to be looking at um, the relationship between tapes and fluid applied. Um, yes. Because that, that, you know, that used to be fluid applied systems used to be limited to just um, commercial building. And, and now they're increasingly being considered for residential building. They're more expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, the, the two cleverest systems on the commercial side are companies that said that say, hey, look, if, if you use our system, which is our field, whether it's the barrier, our tapes, our sealants, you know, the whole nine yards and use our kit of parts, we'll guarantee the water and air resistance of the building. Um, well, it's like, how could they do that? How'd they get to pass the lawyers? Well, once they got it past the lawyers, it's like, okay, you can't substitute anything or it voids the warranty on the system. Well, what have you just done? You've, you've developed a system of products that are designed to work together, but you've also cornered the market on that whole you know, approach. So I think it's both clever. And, um, you know, I, I think a, one of the a big problems is that if we have all these different possibilities of substrates and tapes and sealants, um, and it gets left for the architect or the builder to figure out which one goes with which, that that's not systems thinking, right? Systems thinking is, Let's make sure that all these fit together into a kit of parts. Um, so I think it's a smart move from a manufacturing and a marketing perspective, but it also just makes sense from a, 
I mean, we don't build automobiles that way, right? Like, hey, let's just change this out. Um, they're very careful about what works with what. Um, I, I always like to say, buy the cheapest car you can seven years into its life and drive it into a rainstorm and it probably won't leak. We can't make buildings that stand still not leak. So, you know, it, it, we can do this, but um, we got to get some cooperation between all these different materials. Yeah, Peter, on that note about, you know, making buildings that don't leak. I mean, uh, a couple of guys in the in the comments have talked about the difference between manufacturers instructions and what actually happens on the job site. I know you touched on that earlier and the value of release papers in making tapes that are actually manageable to work with on the job sites. Hmm. So, uh, you know, what, it's one thing to, to talk about how a tape actually performs once it's installed properly, but it's another thing to talk about how the tape is, how manageable it is to install the tape in the first place. Yeah, re release papers are a tricky subject because you, if you want an aggressive adhesive on there, aggressive acrylic or what have you, um, if it's aggressive enough, it's going to stick to itself, right? So if you want a, a tape that is not that aggressive, when you're applying that tape, and, and in many cases you're overlapping that tape, you want that tape to stick to itself, right? So it's a, it's a double-edged sword of, you know, where, where do you find that fine line of an aggressive adhesive that's going to stick to anything or an adhesive that's going to not stick to itself, stick to its own backer. And so it's, if you really want an aggressive adhesive, you're going to have a release liner on that. Yeah, it's a hard one to get away from. And then talking about, you know, where things are going to go in the future, I think you're going to see a wider range of, of application temperatures, you know, getting down to zero and over 100 degrees. So, you know, you're not, you're not restricted to a 70 degree day to apply your tape. Um, I think there's going to be more work on uh, vapor permeable adhesives because you can have it a vapor permeable, permeable backer, um, but a lot of times that adhesive layer is what's what's not, what's impermeable. So I think you're going to see more and more. I was talking with a manufacturer yesterday. They have an adhesive that's vapor permeable, very vapor open. Um, it's yeah. on a backer that's not at this point, but they could easily apply that same adhesive to a permeable backer if that's important. Um, you know, some of these stretchy uh, films, the polyolefins that you see, like the 8067 and, and some of these other manufacturers, Sometimes they're too stretchy. It's hard to apply them without getting a lot of fish mouths on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you gotta, you gotta find that fine line. But I think these manufacturers, again, they, they have a lot of smart people working for them. They're gonna start to dial that in. So it's gonna be easier to work, for, work with. It's gonna have you know, more applications um, and a wider window. Uh, and you know, it's gonna have more functionality to that tape. You know, uh, Steve Basing and I, uh, I've presented once at the Pressure Sensitive Tape Council Summit, and um, Steve and I were actually scheduled to present uh, together at their the second one, uh, which was this past May. But what's interesting is they didn't used to have a PSTC, the Pressure Sensitive Tape Council, focus on the building industry, right? Because most pressure tape manufacturers. Um, they, they do it for dozens of different industries, but there's real interest in um, their opportunities to make more money by supplying tapes to the construction industry. So that's another change I think is coming is that, um, you know, it used to, you know, there's a lot of things in the building industry where we simply have borrowed from, you know, the whole reason we use the ASTM uh, I forget the number now, the boat test. That, that's a stupid test to, to use on buildings, but it's borrowed from another industry. Um, and so the more that we get product development and, and product testing that's specific to our industry, the better the systems can be. Um, and so the, the PSA tape is an example of an industry that, you know, PSA tape manufacturers make for all different types of applications, but there's a real strong interest on their part to um, develop products for the building industry. Then that's relatively new. Peter, I, I know you don't like the boat test because um, I've heard you say that a few times. 
Um, so, so I'm curious if, in, and that test is used for house wraps. So I'm curious if you're doing wingnut testing on house wraps, what would some of your, what kind of testing would you do? Oh, that's great. You know, um, Paul Fazette, Dave, you knew Paul, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Paul Fazette was the head of the construction and technology department at UMass Amherst. And he wrote an article probably 20 years ago now about how silly the tests were for whether it's the barriers. And you can still find this article where he took a piece of wood that simulated the cladding, the weather resistant barrier, and then a piece of wood that simulated the wall sheathing. And what he did was he put drops of water and uh, a paper towel such that when he rubber banded them together and the water was under tension, right, he would uh, pull them apart at different times to see if the paper towel was wet, like did it make it through? And um, very simple test, certainly not ASTM, but he said all the other tests, the boat test, the hydro head test, they're not what happens in assembly. Why don't we just make it a little assembly and test that? And so um, you can still find that article and, it, and that's the type of testing. I mean, Paul was, he's retired now. He probably would not be offended for me to say that he preceded the wing nuts. He was definitely a wing nut himself. Um, and I think you, I think you told me last year sometime that um, that you believe that you had ob had observed that recently on a project that you looked at with actually a pretty high quality house wrap, but that water was just trapped behind the siding, had nowhere to go, and so it was failing. The water held in tension between layers is behaves quite differently than running down a surface or. Um, it's one of the great, you know, forgiveness of rain screen is that it's not just that they circulate air, it's that they, they don't hold water in tension um, between uh, two materials because that water is going to behave quite a bit differently than running down the face of it. There's a uh, b b building s s s science guy. guy guy on LinkedIn, you guys might know Stephen Doggett. Um, he's he's bet, bet, been doing wing nut testing essentially and 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 his latest one is uh, uh, testing WRBs, specifically ones with a fleece coating or, or multi-layer multi and he's hmm. he's finding that there's some, um, I, th I think he's been testing it with a seven inch head of water and he's finding that that water isn't getting through it through, through the WRB, but it's actually slipping down in between that face coating and the, and the actual waterproof layer, which brings some question to um, relying on, on, on taped, taped joints with those WRBs. I mean, which, which defaults back to, I think, I think a lot of us, you know, prefer to rely on mechanically lapped joints when possible, at least, at least for rainwater. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and just while we still st still have a f few f few minutes, I did want to I'm also also mention I really enjoyed your series on roof roof vent venting. I know I know one of the the uh, many times I've read bit, bit Bill Rose's book book Water Water and Buildings. It, it took took me a few times through to start to understand what I was reading. But uh, one of the stories that jumped out was that the whole roof venting thing. Uh, yeah. the, the, the rules we're using today were like prescribed in 1942 or something as a placeholder. It, like when they wrote those rules, they specifically said this, this is a place, this is a placeholder we expect within 10 years, it'll be corrected. And, you know, 70, 80 years later, we're still using those same rules. So you guys have been actually working on, on, on finding what, what works, um, better than, than those, those old prescribed rules. I mean, yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Bill Rose has weighed in on a couple of the wing nut uh, roof testing on GBA. Um, oh, okay. Brilliant guy and um, uh, he's retired now, but he's still very involved and, and likes to keep track of what's going on uh, and, and feels pretty strongly that we should not uh, except without skepticism, uh, 
rules of thumb that have come from who knows where. I mean, Bill Rose is our, probably our only building science historian. Um, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's really an amazing force um, because of what he, what he understands about buildings based on um, sort of the, the, his, the history of building science and its development, which suffers because it's largely cold climate. You know, a lot of the really amazing building scientists come from, you know, Canada or the northern part of the country. And a lot of the original rules with vapor permeability and venting that came from the Forest Products Lab, which is Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Armando Cobo, I'm sure, is out there. He's constantly saying, hey, you know, we're down here and building a lot of buildings in something other than wet, cold climates. Um, and so that's, you know, it's funny when we discovered David Nicastro, who has a durability testing lab at University of Texas, Austin. Um, when I first made contact with him, I said, hey, you're doing great testing, but it's not cold climate. So if we're gonna do testing, we, we need to make sure we have at least three test facilities, one in a warm climate, one in a cold, wet climate, and probably one out in the Pacific Northwest because they're wing nuts of their own making there. Yeah, well, so what do you think would, would be, what's, what's the next wing nut test that you'd like to get sort of um, that what, what, what should we test that we can get others roped in and you guys can do the work of consolidating all the data. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, when I, I presented at uh, the better buildings, better business, the B4 conference, this is just before the COVID shut everything down. Um, I did a presentation on my third presentation there on wing nut south of the ridge testing. And I got two guys who said, maybe a guy and a gal who said, uh, hey, you're telling us we should be doing soffit vent testing. I'm going to go do it. I have a fogger, but I haven't heard from him. So I, the, the testing that we've done on uh, soffit to ridge cathedral vent testing, it, it's not even close to scratching the surface. We need to be doing a whole bunch of those tests um, to to build up on the, the anecdotes that I started. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost 65. I'm, uh, we, I, I need uh, younger legs to be doing some of these. I can't carry a blower door anymore. You know, we did have, um, someone did ask, and since, since the roof testing has been the subject for the last couple of minutes, someone asked what um, the takeaways that you have found so far are. Yeah. Um, like what, or surprises. Yeah, so the, the one really big surprise is that uh, if there's one side of a pitched roof that sees a lot of sunlight, another side that doesn't, um, south and north, I'm finding that the stack effect is driving the air up on the south side. And then when it gets to the ridge, sometimes rather than exiting, it runs down the north side. And the question is, is that a bad thing? Well, it's still air movement, right? Yeah, so, I was, was going to say, is that, that doesn't seem like a bad thing as long as you're moving the air, right? Yeah, but it's not the way the manufacturers draw the arrows, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. The other thing is pitch seems to make a really big difference. You know, you get down to around 312 and things really slow down. Um, it was interesting. Dave and I did a test that's actually on Green Building Advisor uh, a, a, a roof on his house that goes from like a 312 to a 812 or? Yeah, four, yeah, four to a 12. Four to a four. 12, 12. Yeah. And uh, it took a long time, but we got air through there. And it wasn't a surface of the roof that was very hot. The other thing is that um, the, the vent chute on Dave's house is three quarters of an inch and we got good flow there. Um, but I did talk to a, an, an old timer from GAF um, just before he retired. And he's done a lot of field testing of airflow from south at the ridge. And what he said was inch and a half is the sweet spot. That if you make it an inch and a half, it's less de dependent on pitch. Um, now, he's retired. He's gone. Um, I think he's right, but 
we need people to do more testing and more testing with different pitches. I'm, I'm really interested at Dave's house. We did testing uh, around a skylight. Dave held back the furring strips to let the truncated or the cut off vent shoots communicate with the vent shoots on each edge that went to the top. And we got good flow mm -hmm. around that. Well, I'd love to do testing of, uh, of uh, hip and valley systems. Like if you, if you hold those back, um, does, and so all the truncated shoots that are there, you know, how many, how many shoots can you, can you truncate and dump into a one that is soft at the ridge and get significant airflow? Um, don't know. I'll bet your pitch makes a really big difference yeah. with hips and valleys. I agree. I guess. Do you, I mean, uh, on a pr practical note, um, when I spec vents, I always spec Aki vents inch and a half vent. They're the only inch and a half vent I'm aware of. Well, uh, besides the uh, Coroplast one, whatever they're called. Do you guys know of other, like prop event and the ones that are more common are all one inch, I believe. Is there a way, I wonder if we could try to get some of the bigger manufacturers to just start making bigger shoots. I guess that's a big, that's a big change. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the roofs that I tested was an inch and a half and I don't remember, uh, he just ran two by fours, you know, from Eve to, to Ridge. And I'm not sure if I don't, I don't remember if the uh, Ridge vent he used was simply an inch. Right, so that you get a bunch of, bit, bit of a backup from the inch and a half down to an inch, or whether he had an inch and a half uh, ridge uh, vent. And I also, I also don't know the impact of different type of soffit vents. Right, I mean, every building that we that I tested, in, like Dave's, they all had different ridges and different um, soffit systems. Mm. So. I frankly think they play a much smaller role than the pitch and the depth. Yeah. And the code is completely silent about, um, it tells you a minimum of an inch is required. Um, and it says nothing about the pitch of the roof until you get to 312. So you're talking about the different depths of those uh, roof venting systems that you can buy off the shelf. I think there's a Mike Curtin article on Fine Home Building about where he used uh, rigid foam and he kind of did little spacer blocks to make the entire rafter bays. Do you recommend that kind of system as opposed to baffles? Um, when you say baffles, you mean like proper vents? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, I don't, I, I don't, think there's anything inherently better or not between those systems, except that the ones that I see get site built are almost always more robust, right? Uh, they get, they get beat up a lot less. Um, it's interesting. I have seen problems uh, with um, uh, the proper vents where the moisture is getting trapped at the flanges. So, you know, when you take the roof apart, there's just these lines of mold that are right where the flanges bend down. Um, but other than how, how tough they need to be or not, right? Um, I, I generally find that if they're flimsy, they're compressed and they're not even close to what the dimensions are, right. you know, compared to what they were meant, meant to be. Yeah. Well, guys, we're just about at our time. Um, as, as a way to wrap up, I wonder if each of you would want to um, give us uh, what's the one thing from the conversation you'd like our guests to take away, or, or what's the one thing you think will have the biggest impact on the industry that we could all, all do, which, which may be repeating things you've already said, but what's, 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 what's the uh, takeaway? <laughs> I'll go first, Dave. I think being a wingnut is a discipline. And the discipline is to question, like when I was trying to figure out which type of waterproofing to put on the outside of my concrete foundation, I, I didn't know what test to look for. And then I thought, 
hell, I'll just do it myself. And so I developed a little test with the turkey baster, um, which makes me the laughing stock of the neighborhood, frankly, because I'm out in my driveway doing this uh, on a weekend. But I learned, I learned more about how it worked, how to change the test. Um, it, it, it's gotten me to think about almost everything I do, like question, um, well, how is this going to work? And do I need to figure out how it works or can I rely upon what the common wisdom is? It's a process, right, Dave? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, Peter. It, it's, it comes down to trust but verify. Um, you know, you, you can do your research, you can read the literature, you can, you know, look at the, the different opinions out there, but doing your own testing is actually pretty easy to do. Um, and so, you know, when, <laughs> when you, you know, when, when you have a decision to make and you're just not sure, just come up with a simple wing nut test. And I, have to point, nut. I have to point out that I broke one of the wings and I had to repair it with a pressure sensor <laughs> adhesive tape. What, what kind of tape was that, Peter? It's, it's zip tape. <laughs> Well, All you know, right. one, one thing, guys, is uh, I've worked with a lot of high quality contractors over the years. And one thing I no, note, notice about that, uh, the contractors I've worked with is that obviously they have repeat clients, clients that they go back to for work in the future. And a lot of times that's the opportunity to see how well something is performed. It's like you're doing an addition on a house that you've worked on before and you're opening it up and you're seeing, oh my God, what did that, that stuff just didn't hold up or that stuff did great. So maybe it's um, contractors out there building a relationship with their clients and sort of setting the expectation that they're going to, that they're going to use those houses to sort of see the, to check out the quality of their work in the future. That's a great point. You know, um, the South mountain uh, Abrams, um, John. John, John Abrams, Abrams yeah. you know, with his customers for life, approach or philosophy that you know the there are a lot of builders that just never want to go back to one of their buildings ever again and then there's guys like john abrams um who are constantly trying to get back into their houses they built because they want to see what did it did and did not work there's a great article on uh, building green called um the role of failure in buildings and uh nancy clanton is a lighting engineer who doesn't uh does a interview with each of her customers like six months down the road with what worked and what didn't work in our lighting system, our relationship. So she goes seeking the feedback. So Rob, I think you're right. We, we need to stick with our buildings and stick with our customers and uh, learn from that over time. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, Pete, Peter, uh, Steve, Steve, Steve Bazek insists I ask you uh, what, your, what your Instagram handle is. Emily and Robin both, both answered it, but I think Steve just wants to test if you know your own uh, Instagram handle. Oh, that son of a bitch, he owes me a phone call. In yes, fairness, I, I told him you never know when he asks you on the podcast. It is a sore point. Apparently. I asked him once, I, early on, I said, they were talking about IG. I said, what the hell is IG? <laughs> like insulated glass? What does IG stand for? WTF. WTF. All right. Well, uh, guys, th th thank you very much for your time and expertise. This was really fun and interesting. And I think we'll see some WTF uh, testing out there, hopefully, and maybe some follow-up conversation on GBA. Um, Thanks. Yeah, Mike, there were a lot, there were a lot of questions tonight that we didn't get to. Yeah. So, you know, head to GBA after this gets posted. Um, and I apologize for that. The conversation just kind of rolled in a lot of, and I didn't get to a lot of the questions. So head over there and ask them again. We'll try to get them answered for you. Sounds good. Mike, our, our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, have a good guys. night. Good night now. <laughs>